Today is a 34 megawatt wind farm located in County Limerick in the southwest of Ireland. The wind farm was first consented in 1999, so it's been quite some time in development. We commenced construction on site on the project in September 2012, and the wind farm first exported its full export capacity in early 2014. As project manager on the development, it is my job to take the project from a proposal on the design tables and convert that to the reality which is now on the ground. This project supplies the electricity to switch on our lights and to boil our kettles. And it does this by effectively and efficiently extracting this power from the wind that blows over our island. The direct result is less coal and oil fumes sent up the chimney stacks of our traditional power stations and less money being spent outside of the country. We have a long and involved process at SSE before we embark on a project like this. Indeed, it is the same for any of our large capital projects. We carry out this due diligence to make sure that we're 100% confident that the project is feasible. We need to have an expert understanding of what's required to deliver this project to above world-class standards. The construction period of the wind farm is just perhaps 2% of the overall lifespan of the wind farm. We just need to be sure that it fits in with its environment and its community. We intend managing the operation of the wind farm for many generations to come. The wind farm needs to be incorporated correctly into the landscape and into the receiving environment. At Dithe Wind Farm, we needed to be extremely vigilant in developing our proposals. During the planning stage, which extends back more than a decade, the site became part of a special protection area. This imposes considerable requirements on what we can do during the construction stage. And the purpose of the SPA here is to protect the habitat of an endangered species of bird. The designation is robustly protected by the EU under the Ensure 2000 Directive. During the construction phase, we worked closely with the local authorities in the area and engaged with other stakeholders such as Inland Fisheries, National Parks and Wildlife, Irish Aviation Authority, Irish Forestry Services, RTE, mobile phone operators, among many others. During the construction of the wind farm, we decided to submit the project for a sequel award. The Athea Wind Farm entered and completed this extremely rigorous scheme that provides a sustainability rating for projects. Athea scored 92%. One of the highest scores ever achieved was 95% for the Olympics landscaping works. And that's the context in which Athea Wind Farm sits. The project construction was scheduled to work around the bird breeding season. No ground disturbing works were permitted from March to September. Traditionally, the, the driest and most desirable period for us to carry out civil engineering works. Ornithological or bird monitoring surveys have been carried out during the planning phase and into the operational phase and continue to be carried out. This massive body of knowledge is a very positive result of the wind farm and should help greatly in our understanding of the patterns and lifestyle of the birds which visit our shores. The project and design team went well beyond world-class norms in managing the environmental elements of the project. We constructed additional wetland areas, set aside large areas which provide suitable foraging environments for wildlife, installed wildlife boxes and sets and took part in the One Million Trees a Day initiative.
The FAO site has a number of particular environmental sensitivities. This is primarily due to the fact that it is the Natura 2000 in the European designated site. It has been designated to protect the hen harrier. This is a native Irish bird that is under threat. Its numbers have been declining for a number of years. Uh, we have been monitoring the activity of the bird on site since 2008 and now have, have a very good understanding of its flight paths and how it interacts in the sites. So not only have we been monitoring the, the bird itself, we've also undertaken some monitoring of its food source to see um, what the abundance of, of the food source there, are they collecting and we've done then undertaken a number of habitat management initiatives to improve the habitat both for the hen harrier and for the the, the prey that or the, the food that it preys on. So uh, some of those initiatives have been um, management of invasive species. Uh, rhododendron is a particular issue uh, in that part of the world and once it gets hold it can spread and um, cut out all the other natural vegetation. So we're going to talk a programme of um, eradication of that within the site. Some of the other activities that we undertook was the 24-hour monitoring of water quality um, and a, a very rigorous um, uh, urban sustainable drainage design as part of the, the site construction. So we installed some uh, nest boxes for the smaller birds and we also had noticed that a uh, pine marten uh, was in an area, so in the area, so we also installed a, a box for that. There was uh, an old uh, unused quarry um, at the far end of the site and we re-landscaped that, planted some native uh, trees and reshaped the uh, the pond there and it's coming back very well. There's some nice bulrush rushes coming back onto it. Rawbridge, who were the civil contractor, was awarded the uh, contract for the construction of the Atea wind farm in the Atea County Limerick for SSE. Uh, the works involved the construction of 16 wind turbine bases, all the access roads and associated works. Um, Rawbridge have been uh, working in Ireland since 1967, we're uh, one of the largest civil engineering contractors in the country. Only late, you know, the, the, especially the wind farm sector back in Ireland that the work is picking up um, and we were lucky enough to, to get on board with SSE. We'd worked previously out on the wind farm adjacent to Ate, the Dramada wind farm back in 2008. Um, when this project came up uh, we tendered for it and as we'd previous experience with SSE we were able to, we had the knowledge of the site, we'd done a bit of investigation previously when we were on the Dramada job back in 2008. Um, so it was beneficial for us to, when we got in on site, that we were aware of a lot of the, the landowners and problems with um, ground conditions and everything that, that was out there, we were aware of it. My role on the site itself was uh, as project manager. Um, I suppose that the role as project managers involved the coordination of all subcontractors on site, uh, liaison with the, with the client SSE on a daily basis. Um, Roadbridge performed the, the role of PSCS, which is Project Supervisor Construction Stage, which basically means that we were responsible that all contractors coming on site, that your, it was SSE handed us over the role to perform as Project Supervisor, which entailed coordinating with all the, the other contractors coming on site. I suppose the day-to-day the -day running as well, the site was just coordinating the works with the um, our own crews on site with our own environmental managers, our safety managers, our construction managers and the guys on the ground. Because of the nature of the site itself, there's a lot of turbery up around there. So during the, I suppose from April till September, you have a lot of turf, people coming in cutting turf. So that again, it leads to another issue with site safety. When you have a lot of heavy plant accessing around the site that you're coordinating with the locals to ensure that they're aware of the works and Basically, they're not putting themselves in the line of fire. It, the fact that it's an SPA with the hen harrier, the construction period was from the 1st of September to the 31st of March, so you're actually working through the winter, which is not ideal for those kind of ground conditions. We were approached at an early stage by the TA Tidy Towns Committee um, to see if we would be willing to, to lend any assistance uh, on certain projects they had inside in the, the village. Um, which we were more than happy to do. We got, uh, got good feedback from the Tidy Towns Committee um, 
again, it's it's something that we're we're anxious to do to to get involved, get involved with the local community on any projects we're doing. As the environmental manager for the site, I briefed all um, site workers on the importance of understanding the SPA status associated with the site. Um, and also, because this area is, has a wide uh, catchment area and there's lots of river, rivers and streams that are used by breeding salmon, mitigating ag against uh, potential water pollution was a, an, a, of utmost importance to us here on the site. Um, part of this involved uh, regular monitoring of uh, rivers and streams upstream and downstream of the site. This involved two processes. One was uh, grab sampling, which is what I'm holding here. Um, it's basically just taking samples from various points upstream and downstream of the site. And also, as well as grab sampling, which we did uh, and brought to the, la to the laboratory um, for analysis, we also had an in-situ device that was in, in place in the uh, Nakhim Slaw stream, which is approximately 700 metres downstream of the site. And the uh, parameters that we looked for in that case were turbidity, uh, pH and temperature. With the uh, FGA status, we, we worked hard on um, environmental enhancement within the area. Uh, this took the effect of erecting uh, bird nesting uh, and pine marten den boxes around the site. Also, we produced a bare ground management plan. Um, this bare ground management plan basically allowed for areas that have reinstatement where uh, natural vegetation had not occurred. Uh, because it was an SPA site, we weren't allowed to uh, bring seed on site. To address this matter, we um, subcontracted a specialist from Northern Ireland, um, Eco Seeds, to come on site and to harvest um, the heather seed and purple moorgrass seed um, in areas where it was in plentiful supply with the intention to, uh, to sow the seed in May 2014. In it, we were particularly interested in establishing the exact carbon footprint of the whole project, including construction, supply of wind turbines, staff and contractor travel, delivery of components even from China. We needed this information to demonstrate the exact payback or neutralizing period required to balance the carbon produced in developing the wind farm. We used the international standard ISO 14064 greenhouse gas accounting. In this way we can compare the construction of a Thay wind farm with other wind farms throughout the world. We can then get more efficient at reducing the carbon needed to put these clean power stations on the ground. Our team at a Thay wind farm started out as a highly professional group of people with a lot of experience in designing and constructing wind farms. In the Thay we've learned even more and we've gotten better in developing and delivering wind farms in a sensitive and hugely valuable receiving environment. We'll be taking this body of knowledge forward to our next projects. We'll be using this baseline as the metric on which to continually improve our ability to efficiently and sensitively deliver wind energy projects. Wind is now a mature technology. Certainly in my 20 years experience, the industry has developed beyond the wildest, earliest expectations. Wind turbines have become larger, and more efficient. The technology and understanding of how to integrate wind energy into a national grid is led by Ireland. Global grid operators look to Ireland to understand wind energy and grid management on an island grid. Is wind the answer? Wind is definitely part of the solution. Is wind cost effective? It absolutely has to be, otherwise it will not survive. Is there a future for wind? 
there's a clean and well-defined future for wind farm owners like SSE. Here we understand what we're part of and we're part of the long term and we need to continue to work very closely with our stakeholders and with our neighbours. I certainly draw comfort from the fact that there are fewer ships of coal docking at our shores in Ireland. And if we remember Sheikh Yamani when he formed OPEC, they asked him, when will we see the end of the oil age? I don't know if you remember his answer, but it was, the stone age didn't end because we ran out of stones. We see companies that are technologically advanced and which act ethically in this world are outperforming those that don't.